Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week we have two great guests, uh, Admiral James Stravitas, author of 2054, and Dr. Cornelia Griggs, author of The Sky Was Falling, a healthcare doctor during COVID. Now, you got to remember, we love to take your questions. So write into politicsworldroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. And please check out the links to our sponsors, The Washington Post, Earth Breeze, and Lomi in our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting these sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. And hey, James, about the only primary I focused on uh, this week was Ohio, where Trump had a huge night in March. Not sure how it's going to look in November. It was a tight race for the Senate uh, to run against Sherrod Brown. And he came in in the end and he endorsed a rich auto dealer who clobbered the candidates of the old GOP guard. He did the same in the House race. If anyone has any doubt, this is the Trump party. He can deliver in primaries. Now, his candidate, Bernie Marino, may be the ideal foil for Democrat Sherrod Brown to beat in the fall. Marino has changed his position any number of times. It's convenient. Uh, his, it was his Republican primary opponents that revealed this was there was a, a man on a sexual profile once linked to his website, I guess it was a man on man. Uh, he, of course, blamed a young aide. My guess is we're going to see that again from outside groups in the fall. And Ohio's a red state, but no one is better in winning in that environment and dealing with people who now vote mainly Republican than Sherrod Brown. And he is an, a, a genius at exposing hypocritical opponents. Remember Josh Mandel. I, I think it's perfectly feasible that there'll be enough ticket splitters for a for Trump and Brown to win in November. Now, you know, just the, the only other thoughts, Biden showed some weaknesses in these irrelevant primaries. Gaza is still turning off some young voters. They're not voting or writing or something. But Trump more so. Half of Haley's supporters in Ohio said they'd back Biden in November. James, what do you think? About what you think. Uh, I, I, I don't think it, it it hard to overestimate how, the central relief that it was Marino and not Dolan. Dolan, Dolan was the establishment candidate. Yeah, I mean, right? I mean, maybe be careful what you wish for, but uh, I can assure you that the Democratic consultant community was ecstatic about last night. And, and I, he, he, I think, and most people thought Dolan was on track to win, to actually win. I mean, I don't know he could trust primary polls, but they were close. He was actually fast. up a couple of days. And I think down the Trump yeah. in polls. Yeah, I think the Trump dropping the hammer just shows you how much power he yeah. has over there. I mean, real power. No, I think you're absolutely right. He um, um, he he did it. And uh, I, I talked to Ohio Democrats uh, uh, this morning. Boy, they say there's. There's other stuff for Marino that uh, Marino was not. Uh, uh, you're, you're right. They they dreaded running against uh, Dolan, who, but they think there's 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 stuff to work with against Marino, and Sherrod can work it usually brilliantly. Um, yeah, yeah. James, Great. one of the undercover stories this week, really undercover, was Trump, the great China basher, switched his position on banning TikTok as long as it's own by China. Why? Well, an American billionaire with a heavy investment in TikTok dined uh, with the four-time indictee in Mar-a-Lago. you have any question? There may have been a quid pro quo there. But this is part, I think, of a larger story, which you've been on to. Trump has big financial needs. Politically, where Biden is out raising him by massive amounts and personally with huge judgments against him in fraud and defamation cases. He needs money. And we know when he needs money, he'll take it any way he can get it. Remember, we had a terrific guest, the Washington Post, Shane Harris, Wake Forest guy, by the way, uh, intelligence reporter, who said uh, this is maybe, maybe three years ago, intelligence agencies were worried that post-presidency, Trump might try to sell or bargain secret information. Man, they ought to worry now. The old Woodward Bernstein axiom, <laughs> follow the money. It's never been more urgent than it might be today, James. Well, I think it's almost as big a news 
<laughs> is he wants he wants to reappoint Paul Manafort as his <laughs> campaign manager. You you don't you don't think that orders for that came from the Kremlin, <laughs> do you? Oh my God! I mean, it's so blatant, out in the open, a hundred percent tariffs on automobiles, bloodbaths. I, I think it, it it's hard. He's been so crazy for so long. You, you get kind of immune to it. But I think, and other people who professionally watch him closely agree with this, he is deteriorating right before you, deteriorating emotionally, mentally, physically. And I think to some extent, you're going to start seeing politically. And he's in, a, he's in so, so, so much trouble. And he just not going to have time to think. But I... And what I don't understand is how he couldn't get the TikTok guy to put up his bond. Well, just that wait, good James. You don't know what's coming in the future. I mean, right. and, 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 and I'll tell you this. No. If this guy is elected and he's still in debt, man, look out. I can see, uh, what's his name? Nelson Peltz uh, <laughs> buying uh, the Grand Canyon. Uh, you can see, you know, what, what are you going to be offered yeah. for the Statue of Liberty, huh? What's... You know, what are you what are you gonna get for you know the location of our yeah. bomb sites? What do you I mean <laughs> he'll give them to sell them the code. You wanna break in here? Well you're right. This is how you do it. I it's it's it, but it's a manifest thing to me. It, it, it was just so so utterly blatant. And he doesn't care. And apparently the look the, the, the difference between a sheep being fleeced and a Trump supporter being fleeced is we're not sure the sheep likes being fleeced. The Trump supporter loves being fleeced. They don't care. They want him to steal their money. No, I, I and I totally agree. I mean, Paul Manafort is one of the sleaziest people in the history of American politics. You know, Roger Stone might be, <laughs> but it's a close call. And uh, that's but, but that's Trump. Uh, you know, he, uh, his campaign uh, is a mirror reflection of the candidate. So, well, we all know the reason that Trump wants to bring Paul Manafort back. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think clear. it may be over uh, in a place uh, um, uh, near Moscow? I think Putin wants to be yeah. plugged into the yeah. campaign. You know, he's interested yeah. in American yeah, he politics. Will be. You know, he, he likes to get the overnight yeah. polls. And the internals, which which then enables yeah, them oh, yeah. to do their work. So, no, it's ugly. Right. But, but again, he's showing some weakness. I don't think Biden had any kind of an impressive showing at all. But uh, Trump's might have been, in some ways, worse. Great in March, but maybe, maybe more worrisome down the road. I don't think there's any doubt. I mean, uh, it was a poll that somebody sent me, but the conviction in New York is, according to the poll, and, you know, you wait, wait and see when it, if and when it happens, but uh, what well, apparently damaged him. I think this thing is... is power to Hold that damn trial, Mr. Bragg. You know, you have to, have to you know, yeah. follow proper procedures to hold that trial. Okay, we got a lot more uh, in the weeks ahead. Anybody that's interested in American politics, national affairs, or world affairs, for that matter, the post is indispensable. I'm sooner go without a morning cup of coffee than turning on my computer and reading the post. And, uh, you know, across the board, it's just a solid, solid outlet, what I would say. I've, I've been reading the Washington Post since, I don't know, 1982. <laughs> When I was working in Virginia, it actually could get a hard, hard copy in Richmond. But I, it's, to anybody interested in national affairs, it, it's essential. Well, I will just tell you a personal story. Saturday night, I was at the Gridiron, annual Gridiron dinner in Washington. The president of the Gridiron this year was Dan Balls, a great, great political reporter for the Washington Post. And the whole Post uh, entourage was there. Jeff Bezos, the owner, William Lewis, the publisher, Sally Busby, the editor, and probably about 80 other Post people. It is one Fabulous newspaper, and uh, I think uh, they're doing great stuff now. You know, James, when life moves fast, 
you, you know, knowing what's going on in the world and, and in your industry is more important than ever. So you get the latest and you stay informed when you subscribe to the post. The speed of the news never stops and quality reporting is critical. That's why the Washington Post is a must read for understanding how current events impact us, our work and our families. James, I'm older than you. I've been reading it since 1969. But the you know, this yeah. podcast is sponsored by the Washington Post, where you can go deeper into the news that matters most to you. Their journalists bring you facts and clarity about Capitol Hill, the economy, climate change, foreign policy, and everything else you care about. Whether it's breaking news updates, the most comprehensive political and international coverage, thought-provoking opinions, or even dinner recipes, a Washington Post subscription has something for every reader. Every day, there are stories that will explain the world, teach you something new, and inspire you. James, you must have some favorite writers at the Post. Yeah, you mentioned one, Dan Bolt. He's the most experienced, currently practicing journalist in, in the entire country when it comes to covering American politics. I mean, I'm sitting, you, you, you know that world better than I do, but I don't know if anybody's got more experience no. than Dan has. He's the best. And he's been around forever. And I've, he's great, I was pleased to see he's president of Gridiron Club. He started, well, he's got he a great vice started. president, James, in case I haven't told you. His vice president, his vice president oh. is named Woodruff. <laughs> That's a pretty oh, good ticket. <laughs> pretty good ticket. Pretty good ticket. Yeah, I mean, that goes to show you how connected the Washington yeah. Post is. Yeah, I mean, again, if you're interested in Washington, uh, it's indispensable. I just I can't, say anything, can't say anything else. I couldn't dream of not cracking open a post. Yeah, and I talked to some of their younger reporters at that dinner Saturday night, like Ashley Parker and Josh Dawsey. I mean, they are just, uh, they are terrific. And of course, the great Karen Tumblety and her boss, David Shipley, uh, on the uh, editorial page. But let me tell you something else. When the NC bas NCAA basketball uh, brackets came out, Monday morning, the first thing I did, I turned to the Washington Post for John Feinstein. There is no one who can write about that better than John no. Feinstein. So it's not just their politics no. coverage is great, but their expertise goes beyond that. It's got a sleekly designed app that makes it easy to stay up to date on the latest news, save stories to your reading list, and follow your favorite authors. You can even listen to their articles when you're on the go. You name it, they cover it. Climate, culture, crossword, cooking, that's just the C words. You can even find advice for those tricky moral dilemmas and personal problems you want to solve. Carolyn Hacks gets right to the root of things with her brilliant advice column. The Post truly does have everything. Now remember, a Washington Post subscription makes it easy to access quality, trustworthy journalism, and it's affordable too. Go to WashingtonPost.com slash war room. WashingtonPost.com slash war room to subscribe for just 50 cents a week for your first year. 50 cents a week. That's 80% better than their typical offer. That's truly a steal. By my calculation, James, that's about 26 bucks. You tell me what you can buy for 26 bucks that's better than a year's worth of reading the Washington Post. It's incredible. It's once again, WashingtonPost.com slash War Room to subscribe for just 50 cents a week for your first year. You also can find the link to great journalism in our show notes. Corporal Carville, every show uh, has a favorite guest. We have several, but at the top of that list is Admiral James Stravitas, former NATO Supreme Allied Commander and author, author of yet another book, actually co-author with Elliot Ackerman, 2054, which is the sequel to their best-selling novel, 2034, which ended in a U.S.-China nuclear war. That was triggered, by the way, by my cousin, Admiral Sarah Hunt. But uh, <laughs> I, I hope she's doing okay, uh, Admiral. You, you know, first, you know, when I, you know, the good news is that America survived after that nuclear yeah. catastrophe. And that takes us to 2054, where a central theme, I believe, is technology, its possibilities and its dangers. A president is assassinated. Could it have been a remote artificial intelligence operation? Could gene editing uh, be involved? Set the stage. So in the first 20 pages, 
There is a scene set at Walter Reed, the National Medical Center, and an autopsy is being conducted. It's not a routine autopsy. It's an autopsy of the President of the United States, who has fallen over dead from an apparent heart attack. As the autopsy moves along, his heart is removed. The coroner holds up the heart and compares it to the echocardiogram conducted just a few months earlier on the president and says, this can't be the same heart. Thus unfolds the novel. And a central question is, who killed the president? Why? Why did they kill him? Is there an artificial intelligence involved? Is this an example of remote gene editing? All of this with a backdrop of a very divisive society of civil conflict in America, Marines called to the Capitol. It's a political thriller, but also a story of biotechnology and artificial intelligence set in the year as the title, 2054. Well, it, it also gets to how critical and how much artificial intelligence is going to change us, especially uh, in national security. It, Picture yourself uh, a thousand years ago, 900 years ago, and there's this thing called the printing press. And suddenly the whole world will have access to knowledge, to books. People will demand to learn how to read. The church is terrified. The rulers are terrified. You don't know whether a printing press is going to end up being extremely malevolent or very beneficial. Often, as is the case here, it's a bit of both. You could say the same about electricity or about the internet. Um, this is one of those technologies that I think will reshape us just like the printing press, just like electricity, just like the internet. AI is gonna reshape society. So the point of the book, 2054, is to show you a cautionary tale of how it could turn out poorly. But it also, as you know, when you read the book, there are moments of real compassion that come from artificial intelligence. Well, you know, as you say, new technology always can be scary. Uh, let me give you another example. I loved the Oppenheimer movie. Yes. But he, he died believing the nuclear bomb he developed would be catastrophic for mankind. But while there are several rogue places that have the bomb that I wish they certainly didn't, almost 80 years after Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, the nuclear bomb has never been used again. That, that's an encouraging precedent. It is. And I'll add another positive side to it. Don't forget the nuclear bomb, which is what we tend to focus on, is one aspect of nuclear power. Right. And ultimately... Uh, I would argue, as we get from fission, which is what drives nuclear power plants today, and the 80 magnificent U.S. nuclear submarines that are the apex predators of the deep, uh, and the countless uh, billions of kilowatt hours produced by peaceful nuclear power, when we get from fission to fusion, which is coming, um, all of our energy challenges could be solved very, very quickly. So it's a two-edged sword. And I think that's the case of all the technologies we've discussed, Al. Right. Uh, let me get you to put on your NATO hat for a moment, which I don't think you ever take off. That was such <laughs> an important post. House Republicans are resisting more aid for Ukraine as Russia advances. Trump uh, has made fun of Zelensky and said if elected, he may pull out of NATO. What are the ramifications, Admiral? That would be a geopolitical mistake of epic proportion for the United States to pull out of NATO. And you need only kind of do the numbers here. Um, the U.S. defense budget, 3.5, uh, 3.6 percent of our GDP is about 850 billion. I think that's appropriate given that we have global responsibilities, 850 billion. To put it in context, China's budget is about $260 billion. Russia's budget, by the way, is only about $90 billion. 
The question I would ask Donald Trump is, how much money do you think those, quote, freeloading, end quote, Europeans spend on defense? And he would say, oh, they don't spend anything. We just, we spend all the money on defense. Eh, wrong, wrong answer. Factually, completely upside down. The Europeans spend $380 billion on defense collectively. It's the second largest defense budget in the world. So just for starters, we'd be awfully stupid to just walk away from the second largest defense budget in the world. Point two, the Europeans deployed with us to Afghanistan. I commanded 60,000 European troops in combat alongside 90,000 U.S. troops. And those Europeans fought and they fought bravely and they died. And I wrote hundreds of letters of condolence to the young men and women who died under my command from Lithuania, the Netherlands, Spain, Britain, everywhere else in Europe. How about the resistance to helping Ukraine now? It's foolish. And, you know, we need only look back to the late 1930s when uh, Hitler was marching into uh, Austria, Sudetenland. Uh, ultimately, of course, he marched into Poland. Uh, and, and we ended up in a war with Germany. And by the way, we got in that war because Hitler declared war on us, and he declared war on us uh, because the Japanese had attacked us, and it looked pretty successful at Pearl Harbor, where the same thing was happening in Europe. The lesson of the 30s is uh, stop these people early, punch them in the mouth before they take over huge chunks of territory. And we ought to have learned that lesson. And thus for the Republican, and actually a very minor number of Republicans who are spiking the aid to Ukraine, I would say, read your history, uh, understand how low cost this is. We're talking about $60 billion. Europe has already put $120 billion on the table. They're looking for a U.S. contribution of $60 billion will break the phalanx of the Russian armed forces. It'll be the best return on investment of a defense dollar in the history of the DOD. James Cargo. So, Admiral, a little over a year ago, uh, we talked and uh, kind of consensus is we, we, we really should be involved in some kind of a propaganda campaign or selling this yeah. to the American people, of course. And we, we predicted that that probably wouldn't happen and that over a period of time, people were tired of this thing, and that, that was Putin's strategy. I think we were, I, I hate to say it, but I think we were spot on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that's what's going on right from our eyes. There's people, I don't know, I'm tired of that. I'm, yeah. You know, it's, uh, well, is there anything you can think of that we can do to try to get this thing across the finish line in the Congress and get people to settle in? It is, is a hell of a good investment to make. Yeah, I think the the arguments we just uh, bounced back and forth between uh, me and Al are the right arguments. The question is, how do you get them in front of the American people in coherent, sensible ways? And here, I think it really is incumbent on the administration as the executive branch. You've worked right there, of course. Um, they've got to do a better job telling the story and uh, pointing out the extreme efficiency of doing this, the low cost of doing it, the consequences of not doing it. These are, I think, very winnable arguments. And final thought, if you look across the Senate and the House and you got your whatever the number is, 550 between the House and the Senate, I would fearlessly predict you could get 450 votes for this thing probably a few more. It's a matter of getting it to the floor. And that means getting Speaker Johnson to get it on the floor, or there's increasing talk about using a couple of arcane parliamentary procedures to get it to the floor. That might be what ultimately has to occur, James. So, so Admiral, almost, some months ago, it was I saw a 60 Minutes thing, and the 60 Minutes correspondent goes, helicopter lands on an aircraft carrier in the middle of the Pacific, and, of course, gets this 60 Minutes type tour. Man, not hard to figure out. The Navy wanted people to see what they were doing out there and, and, and where it was. And in there, they said that China has one aircraft carrier, and it's not even nuclear. Is that, did I hear that right? 
Uh, China actually has two aircraft carriers, and they are not nuclear. They're building a third one, which will be nuclear. And you have put your finger on the weakest link in the Chinese naval suite. But here's the bad news. Um, yes, we have 11 very powerful nuclear aircraft carriers. The bad news is, on the other hand, total number of warships, China has 360 we have 290. Ours are bigger, better, nuclear. We have the carriers. And if you ask me, okay, Admiral Stav, which hand of cards do you want to play the game of battleship in the South China Sea? I'm going with the U.S. But quantity has a quality all its own, as we've all heard often. And China is building, building, building. And believe me, those nuclear carriers are coming. And then last thought on this, Look at what's happened to the Russian Black Sea Fleet. 20%, 30% of it is now sunk. It's on the bottom of the Black Sea, drinking seawater, as we say in the business. And the reason they're there is not because the Ukrainians had nuclear carriers. Heck, the Ukrainians don't even have a navy. They sank a third, including the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, the Russian Black Sea Fleet, using drones, unmanned surface vehicles, exquisite intelligence, which we provided, cruise missiles. So, yeah, we got those carriers, but increasingly they're vulnerable, and China is, is taking a quantity approach. So we had to take the challenge very seriously in the South China Sea. Do you think that, that there's some debate that carriers are going to be outdated and they're very expensive and, it, it, as you said, they're vulnerable to f attacks from the air or from land and it, it, it's not very smart to put that many resources on one vessel. Do you see carriers like 15 years from now still being a key part of American naval strategy? I think they will be, but they'll, they'll have modulated. They'll look different. Um, and in fact, uh, you're the former Marine. The, the aircraft carrier of tomorrow will look a lot like the big deck amphib of today, the uh, Iwo Jima and the Bataan. And these are all the great Marine battles, by the way. All those big decks are named after them. They're about 60,000 tons. A big U.S. nuke is 100,000. So they're smaller. They're conventional powered, fewer people on board. And guess what is on that flight deck? probably a lot of drones. That's what I think is coming in the 15-year future. And yeah, I think probably 20 to 30-year future, you're going to get out of the big nuclear carrier business altogether and continue to build more smaller ships. That's why China is kind of moving in that direction. We ought to be mindful of it. So one quick question. I want to, our carriers have a flat deck. And I see yeah. the carriers from other companies, they, they sort of slope up at the end. What's the, what's the pros and cons of the sloping up as opposed to the flat? <laughs> yeah. just, it's not driving yeah. great. Why do they do it that way and we do it this way? <laughs> yeah, our, our way is better, but it's more expensive. And you got to have very specialized equipment that can throw, literally – throw that thing off. It's called a catapult. Right. And we just throw those airplanes off and, you, and it's very expensive. But the advantage is you can operate much bigger planes and they can carry more bombs, more war, warheads. The ski jump, which is kind of gives the, a vertical lift to a lighter kind of nimble fighter is a, a poor man's version of how you launch carriers. So, um, yeah, a lot of nations, a lot, the half dozen nations who have smaller aircraft carriers, they have that ski jump at the end. And it's the same principle as in the Olympics, right? You, you well, come down and you zip that, up and that makes pick sense. up airspeed. Yeah. So before I let it go out, the, the catapult, the Trump just goes on and on about steam being, I think, the, some kind of, you, you know, you know, it's better than anybody. What's the argument about the catapult that Trump seems obsessed on? And everybody in the Navy is like, what is this crazy son of a bitch talking about? <laughs> he got, you know, with Trump, sooner or later, somebody just 
literally puts a bug in his ear and it just he just gets on a one note and there were some initial technical problems with the new catapults which are electromagnetic driven and even better than the old steam ones this is on the brand new aircraft carrier uh, that was just deployed to the uh, to the crisis so those problems are solved um, we'll probably continue to hear about it for <laughs> it's just like for the rest. Just to like coin the phrase for the rest of his natural life. <laughs> you know, you, you flush your toilet ten times. Actually, I don't. I I have a pretty common experience with it. It seems to work fine for me, but I don't know. But Albert, this show is deteriorating from strategy to, to what? Back Admiral, to um, you wrote about the Russians committing war crimes by indiscriminately yeah. killing Ukrainian citizens, and it's a tenant that you deeply. Believe in, as you say, learned in Annapolis that any military operation should try to protect civilians, minimizing yes. collateral damage. Now, I know in Gaza, the terrorist Hamas, Hamas hides in tunnels, under hospitals, schools, sometimes even uh, in them. But even with that, in Gaza, 30,000 killed, mainly civilians, ch women, children, babies. That's not minimizing collateral damage, Admiral. I agree. And, you know, two things can be true at the same time. Um, October 7th was a horrific, inhuman yes. terrorist attack by a terrorist group with rape and mutilation and torture and hostage taking, an extraordinary event in the history of the Jewish people and, and certainly of the state of Israel. And just to, just to kind of do the numbers again for a second. The United States is 35 times the size of Israel. So when they have an event where a thousand people get killed, and it was more than a thousand on October 7th, but in a U.S. apples to apples comparison, that would be 9-11 with 35,000 dead. Yeah, yeah. And 200 hostages would feel to us like two times three, 35. So would feel to us like uh, 3,500 hostages. So there's hard for Americans to really conceive of this. It's 9-11 times uh, 30 times. So here's the point. Israel is going to respond and going to respond very aggressively. All of that is true. On the other hand, it is also true. 2.2 million people, Gazans, half of them children under the age of 18, and no doubt 35,000 killed at least by now, rubble throughout the whole place. That is an excessive, a, a, a highly excessive casualty count against civilians. Those are both true statements. So how do you square it? W what I would say to my Israeli friends, and I have enormous affection for the state of Israel. I went there first in 19... 1978 as a Lieutenant JG in the Navy. Um, it, when I was NATO commander, I was in charge of U.S. to Israeli military cooperation. I know the IDF very well. Uh, Benny Gantz was the commander at the time. He's now the deputy prime minister. I continue to say very respectfully to my Israeli colleagues, you've got to dial this back. You are losing and you two both know how important the narrative is, the information war. Israel's lost it. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to create a whole new generation of terrorists. It's going to sour relations for Israel, including commercially, uh, for 10 years. It's set back Israeli-Arab relations, and it's deeply harmed the relationship between the U.S. and Israel. So for all those reasons, my advice to the Israelis is dial it back. Boy, I sure hope they, I sure hope they take it. You know that region very well from your previous post. Do you believe it's possible to have any semblance of, I don't know, peace is the right word or not, but uh, um, something less than what we have now without a Palestinian state? No, I think that ultimately the two-state solution is the right path forward. And we can argue about where that would be and when it will come about. But I think the most recent set of events show us that we have to put that on track. And if we don't, guess what? 
Iran is going to end up dominating that region. The, the yeah. way to avoid Iranian domination is the coalition of Israel and the Arab world. And that was getting closer and closer uh, until the events of 7 October. And frankly, this was one of the drivers for Hamas. They saw the Palestinian cause just kind of falling off the, uh, the picture, falling off the piano, if you will. And so they have put it back on the piano. And I think that a two-state solution is going to be absolutely necessary. Otherwise, we're going to allow the Iranians to divide and conquer in the region. That would be geopolitically very foolish wow. for so, the U.S. Uh, to permit that. Well, I, I'm going to try one more question before I turn it back to James. Uh, that is uh, on Trump. Virtually all of his former top military advisors, John Kelly, Jim Mattis, Mark Milley, Mark Esper, say he's unfit for office now. Do you agree? I do. H.R. McMaster, I'll add to the list. Yes. Um, and, and you can you can find plenty of uh, plenty of uh, reasons for all of this. But in particular, just two days ago, three days ago, I saw him saluting a prison choir. He's a former commander in chief. He called them patriots. Uh, he called them hostages. Look, I know what a hostage is. I spent plenty of time in the military trying to free hostages in Colombia and Afghanistan and elsewhere. Um, I know what a patriot is. I served alongside uh, hundreds of thousands of them in uniform. Um, the correct name for that prison choir is convicted felons. So to watch the commander in chief salute them and call them patriots just really is, in my view, um, a, a point of significant disqualification, along with all the things you've heard from people who have worked with him alongside him day by day. And by the way, it's not just senior military. John Bolton, hardly a bleeding heart liberal, uh, has called mm -hmm. Donald Trump unfit for office based on his uh, his time in that office. James? So, Admiral, this is something where politics in defense policy is going to clash. And the Israelis have to understand, people have to understand, if something is not resolved by the Democratic Convention in Chicago, it will be a bloodbath, okay? Trust me. That, you know, we, 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 we're all now old enough to remember 1968, and man, if, if you know, they're going house to house in Rafa, or, you know, bombing hospitals, it's going to be, that the Israeli war planners need to understand that we're working against a political clock here in the United States. I agree with you. And um, in 1968, I was 13 years old, but mm -hmm. I too remember 1968 as a young teenager. And I was scared. I was scared to death for the country. And it was uh, not only the events of the convention, but the whole Vietnam War as a backdrop, the divisive politics of the time, uh, headed, headed into Watergate, uh, right. Often when people say things have never been worse, I say, well, you know, 68 looked, looked pretty bad to me. Uh, and I was 13. Uh, right. So, yes, I agree with all of that. And I, I think the Israelis need to understand that political clock. Ooh. And I think, unfortunately, and, and you're, you two are the political thinkers here, but Bibi Netanyahu uh, clearly has an agenda that does not relate to uh, to the best interests of Israel, in my view. Well, thank you, and I'm, uh, th thank you so much, Admiral. Love you to live. Yeah, right. Uh, Coming from you, that is really that is uh, that is powerful. Um, you know, once again, you can see why you're at the top of our guest list. Uh, everybody out there, it's 2054 by Admiral Stravitas and his co-author Elliot Ackerman. Go out and buy it now. And I just hope we're long, we're around long enough, James, to have yeah, the Admiral on for 2074. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. What a treat. All right. All right. See you Thank next you. time. Have cleaner clothes along with a cleaner planet with Earth Breeze. You read how, what's contained in these commercial, you know, laundry detergents. Of, you know, you go to Costco and get a tub or whatever. And that stuff does not do well in the water system or anything like that. It, it's really a major contributor. And, if, you know, and I, we've said it a thousand times on the show and I'll say it again. 
if we're going to ever beat this environmental thing, this climate thing, it's going to be by a thousand little inventions, and it's being clearly one of the better ones. It is. Earth Breeze Eco Sheets are ultra concentrated, liquidless laundry detergent that look just like dryer sheets. You get the best of all worlds. Earth Breeze is tough on stains and odors while being kind to the planet and your skin. That itchy feeling you get after putting on some fresh clothes, and I know James changes frequently, that will oh, be dude. a thing of the past. Earth Breeze Eco Sheets are dermatologist tested, hypoallergenic, free of bleach, dyes, and parabens. There's even a fragrance free option. We love the lightweight and convenient they are, too. Now, with Earth Breeze, there's no more heavy lifting or measuring sticky blue goo from a massive plastic jug thanks to their sleek and storable design. Their tiny sheets can stop millions of detergent jugs from entering our ecosystem. In fact, 500 million detergent jugs end up in landfills and oceans every single year, making a positive impact in the world doesn't have to come at a cost to you. Because of Earth Breeze, my clothes are clean, they smell great, and I feel like I actually did something good for the planet just by doing the laundry. You have to try them out. They save so much space in your cabinets, and it's great knowing you don't have to worry about forgetting them at the store. They've already knocked out some giant stains and saved some of our clothes from wine and pasta sauce. If you have kids or grandchildren, it is a must. You'll never run out of laundry, but you'll never run out of detergent either. Earth Breeze offers flexible subscriptions delivered via carbon offset shipping right to your door for free. And right now, our listeners can receive 40% off Earth Breeze just by going to earthbreeze.com slash warroom. That's earthbreeze.com slash warroom to cut out single-use plastic in your laundry room and claim 40% off your subscription. Again, earthbreeze.com slash warroom. Also can find the link to A Fresher Planet and Fresher Laundry in our show notes. Hey, James, we're not going to pretend to be detached about Dr. Cornelia Griggs, our next guest. She is quite simply fabulous. Our Sunday Zoom call with a median age close to Biden's. Uh, one younger member is journalist extraordinaire Jill Abramson, whose daughter extraordinaire is Cornelia, a pediatric surgeon in New York and Mass General during the pandemic. She's our, she was our COVID doctor uh, for uh, us old geezers then. She's written a fabulous book, The Sky Was Falling, on those traumatic early months of COVID for those incredibly devoted healthcare workers and she kept careful notes, a family tradition. Cornelia, first of all, thank you for being with us. And I want to start by saying you and the other doctors and nurses who work 24-7, sometimes not knowing if you'd ever see your family again, you were heroes. You really were heroes. It must be infuriating that even today there are COVID debunkers, much of the MAGA crowd and Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who say it was hyped. Well, thank you so much for having me. And absolutely, I think that is one of the most harmful and hurtful experiences a healthcare worker or any essential worker who was working at the time of the first wave, especially of the COVID pandemic. It's just one of the most awful things you can hear. And really the primary reason I started writing everything down and that I wanted to write this book was because I needed to know for myself and for everyone else that what we were seeing, what we were experiencing, the patients who were dying, it was all real. It all actually happened. Um, and I hope that my book is a living testament to that reality. And it, I, I cannot express how deeply hurtful it is when people deny that COVID was real or suggest that it was a hoax that was somehow made up by the medical community. Cornelia, describe those harrowing first few months. Yeah, I think it is no exaggeration. 
to say that it was like living through a real life horror movie. It was nothing that I have ever seen before. And I have been a surgeon since 2011 and I have trained in some of the busiest trauma bays in Boston and New York City. I have, I I deal with dying children on a regular basis as part of my job. And so it doesn't, it, it takes a lot to rattle me. It takes a lot to make me feel alarmed. And that was the first time in my career where I felt my own life was genuinely at risk on a daily basis, just showing up to work. Um, especially in those first few months that are detailed in the book in in March and April and May of 2020. Working 24 seven and not knowing if you'd ever see your families again. I mean, that's, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. That's, the hardest part was that I, my husband was already here in Boston, had accepted a faculty position at MGH. And I was in New York City at the time, finishing my fellowship um, with our two young children who were four and two at the time. And we made the horrible, but in some ways luxurious decision because we had the option to um, send the kids to live with my parents in Connecticut. And so I was separated from them for um, almost two months. And that, that was the hardest part because I, for a while, I didn't know when I would see them again or whether it would be safe. We didn't, there was so much we didn't know. We didn't know if we were carrying it on our bodies, on our phones in our groceries. And, and even going back and recording the audio book, I realized there were so many memories patient scenarios in particular that I had repressed and even forgotten, which is a normal trauma response. And I I think it's no exaggeration to call it traumatic having worked in, in the hospital at that time. I mean, our emergency rooms looked like a war zone. There were patients everywhere on ventilators intubated and Every few minutes overhead, you would just hear another code being called, another patient crashing, another patient needing the airway team to rush to their bedside to try and rescue them. It, none of us were prepared for what we saw. You know, uh, this is a softball, but I think important question. How did two people do? Dr. Tony Fauci, who's still reviled by the likes of Rand Paul, and Donald Trump, who's former COVID advisor, suggest his negligence cost 200 to 300,000 lives. Yeah. So I have to say I have enormous respect for Dr. Fauci, and I think he had a nearly impossible task. The United States was very ill-equipped and unprepared um, in ways that I had never anticipated even as a young doctor here. I, I... I remember naively assuming that in February that we would just somehow be better prepared than we were to face a global pandemic in the United States. It was a naive assumption in retrospect, given the fragility and paucity of our public health infrastructure. But I think Dr. Fauci was a guiding light for a lot of us who worked in healthcare um, in those early days of the pandemic, especially given his expertise in infectious disease and his experience leading the Disease Institute. Um, He was a voice of science. He was a voice of reason. But I was horrified with the Trump administration's and and President Trump's handling of COVID in those early days. Um, I felt personally abandoned as a healthcare worker by the Trump administration's approach to COVID. And I, I am a woman who grew up with a lot of privilege, but I never felt like my life mattered less than it did listening to Donald Trump talk about getting back to business as usual as soon as the first week of April in 2020. It it felt like being gaslit completely. We lost, I think, 1.2 million Americans. One of the worst records uh, in the world. Um, How much of that, uh, if you can do, you know, you quantify, was due to our healthcare system and how much of it was due to Trump's failures? Yeah, so there are... Research who have researchers who have quantified that, and I was recently recently speaking to Eric Kleinenberg, who's a sociologist at NYU, who also has a book out about um, some uh, 
seven different people in New York City, or I think they're all around the country um, in the year of 2020. And um, he had done some of the math and compared the U.S. to Australia, where if you do polls, there is actually now more faith in the medical system and more faith in science and more trust overall in doctors. And I think that is in stark contrast to the United States, where we are at an all-time high for skepticism and resentment towards the medical field in a lot of ways coming out of COVID. And if the United States had had as robust an approach and a public health infrastructure as Australia had in 2020, there would be 900,000 Americans still alive today, still at dinner tables around the country. And, you know, you talk about a virus um, with a mortality rate of 1%, that's over 3 million Americans, right? That is a huge loss. And and that number 900,000 is likely an underestimate because there are so many people who died during that time. And because of lack of testing and poor quality of some of the testing at the time, there are lives that we lost that were likely due to COVID that were not measured as such. It's appalling. James? So, so, Dr. Grace, maybe more than any other person in the country, you live at the intersection of uh, child's medicine, public health, and every advantage. And there's been a lot of studies about the school closings. It, it, is, is your view that they stayed closed for too long or what, what, the mismatch? But there, there is a lot of literature coming out now and that they, we might have been too aggressive in closing schools. Do you agree with yeah. that? I I think now on the other end of that, as a parent to young children, and I feel very fortunate in some ways that my kids were so young that their understanding of what was happening was really, and their awareness was really limited. Um, But I do think we kept kids out of school for too long. Um, And I think part of the reason for that was we just literally, our our schools are under-resourced, right? We didn't teachers were not in a place where they had a lot of faith that they were going to be able to keep kids safe from disease in their classrooms or themselves safe. And I think that's because there was a lot of miscommunication and poor messaging around um, how COVID was and wasn't transmitted, especially in the beginning. Like I said, this time last Uh, This time, four years ago, March 20th, four years ago, we were still not consistently masking in the hospital. We didn't know if we should be wearing masks. March 20th, 2020. So uh, I give us a little bit of a break because we knew so little. um, But I do think in retrospect, and this is a little bit of a nuance to my perspective on the COVID pandemic, I do think we kept kids out of school for too long, and there's increasing data to support that. So it's remarkable. In January, February of 2020, we don't have enough enough equipment for this. And it's not like people people made movies about it, people wrote books about it. it. It was considered to be, even to somebody as remote, to medicine as I am, this was always a possibility that it was going to be some super book. How did that happen? And, and I mean, okay, Trump, it was three years under Trump's watch. I, 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 I'll get that out of the way. But couldn't like a senator or somebody speak up and say, this is not a good situation here. We, to, we better get some masks and ventilators and, yeah. you know, whatever else to supply. Yeah, absolutely. Well, to me, it was very apparent because there were, there were hospitals that were much better prepared, MGH in Boston being one of them. Um, but yes, there are infectious disease experts who predicted this, who anticipated this, who sent warning signals to high-level officials at the CDC. And we consistently underfunded our nation's infectious disease experts who had very little platform to be able to organize around that alarm. Um, And what concerns me now is I... I don't have a lot of faith that we've really regrouped. And the evidence suggests more likely than not, we will face another global pandemic, certainly in my lifetime and almost definitely in my children's lifetime. And 
we were so focused and continue to be so focused on getting business, um, back to usual, um, that I, I, I don't know now in 2024, if we are any better prepared. And that makes me terrified when I think about the upcoming election. Um, if we're going to put people in office who don't believe that COVID was real in the first place or that, um, vaccines are important. I mean, we're at a really crucial point where we need to figure out how to restore Americans' faith in science and medicine um, and do that in a way that is accessible and relatable. Where I live in Boston right now, it is easier, and, and I'm a doctor, right? It is easier to walk down Charles Street to get Botox or lip filler than it is to be seen by an intern internist to get your blood pressure checked. I, I had to beg a friend to be my primary care doctor, and I work here in this system. We have an access crisis that is exacerbating Americans' distrust in doctors and our medical system, and we need an administration at the helm that is dedicated to expanding access to healthcare and preventative medicine for Americans, not who is turning a blind eye and saying, let's get back to business as usual. COVID was completely overblown. Let's never talk about it again. We have only scratched the surface of the collective trauma that we experienced in healthcare and as a society. You know, Cornelio, you, you have, have said or written that one of the reasons you're so worried or even cynical about our medical and health care uh, uh, systems is because it's driven by corporate interest. Could you elaborate on that? Absolutely. I think hospitals are in a really hard place right now, and there's a lot of focus on delivering value-based care, right? Right now, the way most healthcare systems and doctors are reimbursed is by um, treating sick people. We make money off of illness, right? We have not incentivized healthcare systems that benefit or profit when people are well, right? And part of the problem is also the increasing influence of private equity and that lens being applied to the healthcare model. And this is happening in front of the noses of the American public. What we saw private equity do to nursing homes around the country is happening in hospitals right now. And that makes me very concerned and very alarmed. We have seen in some of our nation's best and robust hospital systems, a ballooning in the number of healthcare administrators and bureaucracy and clinicians are being squeezed unbelievably. One of the reasons why it's so hard to see an internist to get your blood pressure checked or talk about healthcare maintenance or how just how to stay well is they are being pressured to give 10 or 15 minutes to extremely sick people, complicated patients for very little reimbursement. And the idea that doctors somehow financially profited on COVID is a total myth. I think what we have seen profit are kind of pop-up wellness industries that are based on very little research. Um, for example, we've seen GLP-1A medications. GLP-1A analogs are brand name medications like Ozempic, Wegovy that are meant to treat diabetes and now obesity, um, there's a huge access crisis. Um, the medications are very expensive. It's hard to find um, a doctor or a reliable provider who will meet with you and talk to you about what the long-term implications of starting these medications would be. And we are seeing all these pop-up compounding pharmacies selling something called semaglutide, um, which may or may not be the same thing as Ozempic and Wegovy, and they're completely unregulated, and they're advertising on social media, and they've become hugely profitable, and they're all over the place and completely unregulated. But the average American is in a really tough spot if, if they do want access to these medications in a safe way that's guided and supervised by a doctor or a licensed healthcare provider. I, I really worry. 
Yeah, well, you, you ought to. It's so, and you just, you know, I think you eloquently stated that uh, cause for concern. Let me ask you one final question, then James can wrap it up. You, you, you write that reflection and recollection can be healing. Did this book help you heal? And what did you learn about yourself, Cornelia? Absolutely, writing this book was healing. And my biggest hope for this book is that healthcare workers or anyone who went through a really hard time in 2020 finds something healing in my story. Writing is therapy for me. It's how I process and organize my thoughts. And um, thank God for my mother. I was raised by a career journalist. And when this all started to unfold, she gave me the best piece of advice, which was write it all down. And I did. And I think that was really unique for a healthcare worker at the time because what the natural thing to do was bury it, forget about it, just try to be in survival mode and move on. And there were days where all I could do was write just a few notes because it was so harrowing what I saw and there was so much death and dying. No, no human being, even my friends who are military doctors are prepared to see that many people die that quickly all at once. Um, but the book is ultimately a, a story of redemption. And I hope people find in the book that um, I, I didn't feel brave in the moment. I didn't feel brave going to the hospital every day. I was terrified. Um, I wanted so many days to run away and go cuddle up with my kids and pull a blanket over my head and, and never come back to the hospital. But there was enormous bravery in the essential workers and healthcare workers of 2020 who just kept showing up to work and doing our job because that was the most decent thing we could do that day. Um, well, I sure think you were brave and I think your mother is extraordinary and I think James agrees. James, you want to wrap this up? One final question. Uh, for a senior citizen, what is your vaccination advice? Like, uh, how, how often should we boost it? Keep, keep getting boosted if you are over the age of 65. Um, there are still 250 Americans dying each day of COVID. It's, it's not gone. Um, I think it's, it's really hard to know who and what to trust right now. Um, but please keep yourself safe, keep yourself immunized. So how, how often, every six months, every eight months? Every four months. Every four, every months. four months. Okay. And, you, and I had a mild months. case of COVID in January, so I have to wait three months. Is that right, Cornelia? Yes, yes. wait okay. three months after an infection. Well, you are a hero. You really are, as are all the healthcare workers and doctors and nurses who work with you. The book is The Sky Was Falling by Cornelia Griggs. Go out and buy it because, first of all, we ought to know what happened and we ought to know the lies that are being told by some and what really happened. And we ought to realize it could happen again. And this is, this is just marvelous. The Sky Was Falling by Cornelia Griggs. Boy, we're lucky to have you, Cornelia. Thank you. And don't forget the Sunday Zoom call role you play as our physician. Sunday's forever. Thank there you, you guys. Go. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Okay. If you're serious about a cleaner home and a cleaner planet, get a Lomi. You know, you know, keep, we talk about this product it is so good. And... You know, I'm so irresponsible sometimes with food waste, and it it, it just it I don't can tell you it makes me feel guilty. It just kind of irritates me that I'm, you know, that casual about it. And this this you know at least gives you some option to just, as opposed to just throwing stuff away and doing no good. I, I think it's a tremendous product. It's sanitary. It's useful and. Uh, I, I would recommend it to anybody. Oh, boy, I would, too. Uh, we, we, we love our Lomi. Uh, just imagine, what if ordinary people like you and me could change the world with a push of a button? Well, you meet Lomi, and you can. The world's first kitchen appliance designed to turn your home into a climate solution by transforming your food scraps into a nutrient-rich plant food. Now that we've invested in our Lomis, has changed the way we deal with our food waste. Now, we've been around a long time, and we're convinced Lomi is the biggest innovation in the modern-day kitchen since at least the dishwasher. It's a smart and simple solution to turn food scraps into plant food in just four hours. 
Loamy transforms almost anything you eat into nutrient-rich loamy earth at the push of a button. It cuts the chore of taking out the trash in half and eliminates bugs and odors in your kitchen. If that's not enough, with Loamy Earth, you get to feed your lawn and garden with an all-natural fertilizer that you created out of your food scraps. It's perfect to jumpstart your vegetable patch now that we're headed into spring. And thanks to Loamy, it feels like we're almost never taking the long, windy walk out to the garbage can. Our yards look better than ever. Your kitchen will look great, too. And thanks to Lomi's modern and sleek design, we felt great knowing we were doing our part for the planet since the day we got ours. And now Lomi's new app lets you track your environmental impact, earn points for every cycle, and redeem them for freebies from Lomi and other great brands. You deserve to get rewarded for doing good. You need a Lomi in your home. So whether you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just grow a beautiful garden, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash warroom and use the promo code warroom to get 50 bucks off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash warroom and use promo code warroom at checkout. Thank you, Lomi, for sponsoring this episode. You also can find the link in our show notes. Hey, now, James, for the outrage of the week. You know, Viktor Orban is a role model for the MAGA world. The Hungarian autocrat dying with Trump at Mar-a-Lago was celebrated by the Right Wing Heritage Foundation. He's depicted as a pro-family, pro-traditional values, anti-woke, anti-LGBTQ, devout Christian. We ought to have a society like his, says Trump. Let's, Let's roll the tape. An administrator at an orphanage in Hungary covered up pedophilia, and according to the victims, tried to coerce them, shame them, beat them, and bribe them to retract their accusations. It didn't work. But then, let's know what comes next. The, the, the Hungarian president and Orban loyalist, Katalin Novak, who prays as a family values Christian, who deplores the decadent West, secretly pardoned this orphanage official, Except who was, had been sentenced, except the word got out. The push for the pardon came from another top Orban ally, the chief bishop of the Hungarian Reform Church. You know, there's been a huge public reaction, I read over there, to this scandal, hopefully jeopardizing this regime, which has curtailed the judiciary and freedom of the press, attacked gay and lesbians, all in the name of Christian democracy. Orban is not a small-D Democrat, and covering up pedophilia certainly doesn't reflect family values or Christianity. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. These are terrible people. I just, one day, someone's going to have to explain to me what they see in this kind of autocracy in Hungary or Russia or something like that. It's, it's, it's one of the weirdest phenomena I've seen in American politics. I... I I don't know, but, but, you know, the CPAC people love him. Wow. I, it, it, my outrage is simply B.B. Netanyahu, after Senator Schumer gave what I, I thought was an excellent and thought-out speech, uh, said he, he, Israel doesn't need to pay attention to him. Uh, really? So, so you, you, you're, why don't you, I'll tell you what you do. You send the money back and you do whatever you want to do. How about that for an idea? And you say, well, I don't, you come to, we invite you to speak to our, our House and our Senate, a joint session. You're always pontificating on something. And if and the United States foreign policy is very much affected by decisions that the Israeli government make, the Israeli government, I'm saying, specifically Netanyahu, and the idea that were not allowed to comment on Israeli politics or Israeli policy is, is, is unbelievable. So we can settle this thing real quick. Just send all the money back yeah. and you don't have to worry. Yeah. Um, uh, BB's allies say that uh, what, uh, you know, people like Schumer and, and a lesser uh, person like me uh, wrote uh, that shows that we're anti-Israel. B.S. 
you know, half the people in Israel, if not more, uh, agree with this. Uh, Bibi's got a popularity of about 19 percent, and he's keeping this war going because he needs to stay in office. If you believe in the state of Israel, which I comfortably say both of us do, then the, the, the greatest act of negligence in Israeli history was Netanyahu on, on October 7th. How is he still there? How, how does this guy have the, well, I guess, what's my guess? It's a, but how, how could he stay after, after letting his country down uh, that much? I, I don't get it. No, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Look, I've gone there four or five times. I love to travel to, to, uh, um, uh, to Israel. James, you have worked in Israel to further their democracy. So, uh, you know, I'm sorry, uh, right, BB and you. Donald Trump and all of you right-wingers. All right. Well, what did Trump say about Jews that vote well, for Well, they're self-hating Jews, basically. They hate their religion and they hate Israel. That's 75% right. of Jewish Americans, by the way. Right. Well, whenever I look at Chuck Schumer, I say, now, there's a man that hates Israel. Well, absolutely. <laughs> and hates his own religion. I mean, it hates his own right. religion. Right. Every time I see him, I said, that's the first thing come to my yeah. mind. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Well, 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 why aren't you proud of your own so fucking stupid. I mean, we we took the kids to Israel. I don't know. This is, may have been twenty years ago, maybe longer, twenty five years ago. We're in the Sheridan Hotel, and the first person we run into is Chuck Schumer. <laughs> Chuck Schumer making the rounds. Hey, now for our listener questions. I just hope our answers are as good as their questions, James. Larry in Philadelphia says the white working class votes against their own interests due to fear and prejudice. Lots of them are Republicans and Trump supporters. They are firemen and police officers and blue-collar workers. How did Democrats reach these people? Well, I mean, start by listening to our show uh, last yep. week with authors who actually ex explore this. And... I, I, I think the way to reach people is that you believed in Trump, you had reason to believe in him, and then he betrayed you. Don't revisit their original decision. Okay, oh, how could you be so stupid? You don't understand. Biden's much better for, for police and firemen and been endorsed by this. Just say, I understand where you're coming from, dude, but, you know, he stabbed you in the back. And, you know, you thought he was going to do something about China. Then, of course, TikTok, he has dinner with the guy at TikTok, and he's not going to do anything about China. Then you thought he was going to, like, protect coal jobs. Of course, lost coal jobs like crazy. Right. And you thought he was going to help you. And now he's talking about cutting Social Security and putting his tax cuts for the people over half a million dollars in. So I, that's what I think but they've been betrayed. Hey, James, Martin in New York City says, do you think there would be any utility in having Biden offer Nikki Haley a cabinet post like Secretary of State to secure her endorsement? No, Martin, I don't. Uh, I don't think gimmicks work very often. I doubt she'd take it. Uh, and I think uh, Biden would just look, uh, would, uh, would look desperate. And also, I don't think she's the most qualified person to be the next Secretary I of State. I agree with you 100% on every count. James Dot in Alexandria, Virginia. She says, says, I know a ton of suburban and city white folks and some rich ones who carry the same rage and resentment that rural folks do. Thinking about our show last week, why does half the country think they're getting screwed when really they're doing pretty great compared to most of the world? Well, I mean, I, the, you know, I, I, how many columns are really that, you know, the economy is much better than people think it is? Uh, there, there's a couple of things that caught my, and of course the government is, the credit card debt in this country is astronomical. And I mean, astronomical compared to not very long ago. So clearly, you know, people feel strapped. The other thing is the cost of living. While when the president says it's coming down, people don't think like that. It it went up, you know, if something costs $20 and the beginning of 2020, and it cost $28 at the end of 2022, and it's now it's $25. You can say, well, it's coming down, but it's still above the the baseline. And I think the combination of, of this household debt and these increases in cost of living have gotten some people understandably fidgety about the economy. Now, 
the, the people that don't have to be fidgety, like people it, so far in the markets, in the stock market, in the equity market is doing pretty goddamn good. And you sure can find a job out there. So I I, I agree that, that there are good reasons to be economically optimistic, but I understand that a lot of people are not. And telling them that they're better off than they think is probably not the best way to go about this. I concur completely. Florence in Vancouver, Canada. Oh, I love that town. Oh, Ask why place. on earth would the Biden administration extend the courtesy of security briefings to a financially and criminally comp compromised presidential Republican nominee, Donald Trump, as initial news reports suggest. They have to. Uh, it is something that's always been done. Uh, I agree. I think there's a risk. I think if they didn't do it, I think Trump would play the victim card, and no one's better at playing the victim card than Donald Trump. I just hope that those briefers uh, are going to be careful and even selective. I think they are. I, I mean, I, th I think the CIA, the FBI, I think they all know who Trump is. I mean, they're right. horrified, but I don't know what they can do about it, but I guarantee you that they'll leave some stuff out. Well, I think they're going to get a clue when he brings Paul Manafort in the room uh, with him yeah, for, uh, yeah. for one of those briefings. Be, Paul will be in the in the briefing, you know. Yeah, so he exactly. Can, he, he will be brief so he can brief. James, you're going to love this one. This is for you. Wally in Calistoga, California. Oh. During the 1991 comeback campaign of Edward Edwards, former Louisiana governor and federal prisoner, against David Duke of the KKK, Edward used the slogan, better the lizard than the wizard. What are some of the taglines or slogans that would help Biden? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> he also said he was better under the sheets than then, David Duke. David Duke also said he couldn't, on the way he could lose, he got caught with a live boy, a dead girl. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, there's so much that has been made of Trump, and I, I, I still think the, the body odor thing is the kind of way to go after him. And, you know, this. this uh, Kathy Griffin uh, has talked about it. Adam Kinzig has talked about it. Guy on the Apprentice has talked about it. And I, I, I think it's true. I think the man stinks. So I, yeah. I, I think somewhere along those lines. But but Edwin Edwards was as good as anybody on his feet. It's nobody fucking better, man. He could think, he could think <laughs> so fast. <laughs> and, you say, and what he was it, an expert at. It took his opponent two hours to watch 60 Minutes or something like that. He yeah. was. He was the best. Yep. Uh, I, I agree with you, James, totally. Um, John in Chicago says, open enrollment for the Affordable Health Care Act saw a 30% increase in people signing up in red states, Texas and Florida, either way. Why don't Democrats campaign harder on that issue? Trump says he wants to replace it, but has no plan. I agree with you, John. Read my Substack column on Friday. Uh, I get into that, uh, and Trump is lying on this. He promised he'd have a substitute uh, for it back in 2016. Never did, and he's not going to now. I, I have a theory of why he did that. And I'll tell you what it is. He did that because it was named after a black person. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. That That's that's all that is. He's, and he'll do something terrific like change the name to Trump Care, but he won't fool with it. It's, it's, he's the most evident I've ever seen at, at being dishonest and duplicitous and everything else. And then he said, by the way, did what you, he said on, on, I guess it was CNBC, that he would cut Social Security. And then now he's, he's trying to backtrack that. He betrays you at every point. Well, he's going, you're right. He, he's lying about, but there's a tape. There's a tape, and there's a tape that can be used in right. September and, and October. Right. And, and, and just, keep hit, just keep hitting him. Just hit him here, then hit him again. And I know but Democrats have this huge financial advantage right now. He's completely run ragged trying to raise money for an appeals bond and get ready for a criminal trial and God knows what else. We ought to just be jumping his ass day in and day out. The only thing I'd add is we also ought to make fun of him every chance we I get. Have to sure, that's that definitely part of There are ways distracted. to make fun of him, and that Plenty drives him crazy. James, I want to get to this last question. It's from Blair in Morristown, New Jersey. Oh, wow. James, a beautiful place. 
James, you are an aging runner like I am. Uh, only months, I'm only months younger than you. What's your secret? How much do you run? Share some tips so I can stay healthy to help defeat the MAGA sanity. I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I'll be, I, I've run 360 days a year since the summer of 1981. I figured that I've run around the world to equate up one and three quarter times. But if right now, I'm so old and so slow. I, I, I'll be out where I think I'm jogging and people will say, hey, James, you got about the afternoon walk, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but my colleague, uh, when I did, I'm the same way as you, James. I just probably don't go as much. My colleague, Hans uh, Nichols, used to call it the Bureau Chief Shuffle. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't much. <laughs> I used to do, um, the one thing I didn't do, and I, I might have been able to do it if I had a contract, is run a six, uh, a 10K under 40. I, I didn't train hard enough. I did like 41 and something. I was really younger. But the objective is to run, to match your age with a 10K. So I got to 44, and I'm trying right. to think how old I was then. I think, I, I don't know. I may have been about forty-four then. That's about. But that's I couldn't good. get. I never got. I never got down. Yeah, I don't. To, you know, yeah, you know, if, you, if you run your age now, it's we so old. It's not. But but if you're in your <laughs> it might be tough 40s, to make it. 50s, 60s, you 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 right. ideal, and it's just good. It's hard to do. It's not. Not everybody does it. But if you it's if, if you run your age, that's supposedly pretty good. Do you ever run a marathon? No. And One I, of my I great regrets in life. To. I, I, I regret that I didn't. Just one time. All right. But, you know, the training it takes to do it, I just wasn't willing to do yeah, right. So, anyway, James, I want everyone to keep those questions coming in because we love them. Uh, and we'll get to them. If we didn't get to them this week, one of yours, we'll get to it next week. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. And don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you check out the links to our sponsors, The Washington Post, Earth Breeze, and Lomi in our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting them because when you do, it helps make this podcast happen. Now, to keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. You can also find other shows you might enjoy on the Politicon YouTube channel or when you search Politicon on your favorite podcast sites. Now, remember, please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our war room planning.